Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the June 2023 update on the performance of my solar array. I'm sorry this month's video is running really late, I've just been uh, snowed under with loads of uh, other stuff. So let's get cracking. First of all the disclaimer, I'm not an expert, there could be mistakes in what I say, please get professional help uh, and advice if you are considering getting any of this equipment. Okay, so let's get into the KPIs. So far our entire system has produced 8,816 kilowatts in the uh, approximately year and a half that we've had the system. Um, year to date, last year, we had produced 2,341 kilowatt hours, and so far this year we've produced 2,632 kilowatt hours. So that's an increase of 291 kilowatt hours, which is otherwise 12%. In terms of the electricity we have imported, last year we imported 972 kilowatts at this point last year, and this year we have imported 3,394. So this is a massive jump, and the primary reason is last year we were not charging the car at home because we had free credit, and now we need to charge the car at home, so we are consuming a significantly more kilowatts. 2,422 extra kilowatts have been consumed, which went into the car, which is otherwise 249%. So that is massive. But keep in mind, from a cost point of view, most of these units are quite cheap because we're on the intelligent octopus tariff. Talking about gas, so so far this year we've imported 17,204 kilowatt hours. This time last year we had imported 17,335. So that's a reduction of 132 kilowatt hours or 0.8%. So the eddy is obviously helping here, but I would say that the, the weather has not been as hot as it was last year. So we're probably burning a bit more gas on central heating. CapEx has stayed the same. We haven't invested in our system anymore. And then in terms of savings, so far this year, we have saved 2,308 pounds 67 pence whereas this time last year we had saved just £640. So we've made a whopping increase of £1,668.54, or 261%. So this is primarily driven from the fact that we added a second battery in the summer month, and that we had now got the Eddie installed, and I was figuring out how to like best make use of it, so we're starting to divert surplus electricity to heat our hot water. Okay, so overall, many of the things are green, apart from we're drawing a lot more electricity, but that is mostly cheap. Okay, so let's look at our performance overall. So here's a screenshot from Enphase. Overall, we produced just over 1 megawatt hour, 1.02 megawatt hours, or 1,020 kilowatt hours in the month. So for us, that's a record. We've hit a new all-time high in the number of kilowatt hours we can produce in a month. Um, from that, we exported exactly 50 kilowatts, we imported 289.8, meaning our house consumed 1.3 megawatt hours in total. If you look at the graph, the aim of the game is not to have any grey sections on these bars. So grey above the blue line means we are importing electricity from the grid, and grey below the line means we are exporting electricity to the, to the grid. So... The notable grey sections here is because we're charging the car, there's not enough solar power, so we have no choice but to pull it from the grid because we have some sort of journey to do. Um, but you can see, for the rest of the days, particularly the second half of May onwards, the sliver of grey above the blue is relatively small, which means that the bulk, if not all, of our demand was being met by solar power. And the tiny sliver of grey is just because the system is always trickling in a tiny amount of power from the grid. It's just how it works. There's a few days early on where we're getting through most of the day with solar power, but there is a little bit that we're having to pull from the grid. And of course, in terms of export, you can see on the most part, the export is hardly anything, if not none, which is really what we want, because we want to divert our solar power to heat our water. And if that's done, we want it to go into the car. And the car, on the most part, is a bottomless pit. Um, you know, we can always use up the energy. We're always doing more miles than we have solar power to, to, to provide for it. So, so we've done well in the month of May. That's a pretty good deal. Overall, 
it says our grid dependence is 23%. So we were, we were off grid the rest of the time. And of course, this 23% is inflated because of the car. Just those kind of three days where we've pulled a lot of energy from the grid has taken us up from probably a very low number up to 23%. But either way, this is still really, really good. And finally, looking at the array graph on the right hand side, you can see how each panel has contributed during the course of May. And as I keep saying, this one panel, which has got the most shading, has still pumped in 30 kilowatts, which is over a day's uh, consumption for us. And for some of you who don't use as much power as us, that could be two or three days worth of power for you just out of this one panel. <laughs> okay, moving on to talk about the best and the worst days. So the best day was the 26th of May. We produced a whopping 49.2 kilowatt hours. So, so far that's the best our system has ever done. But of course we have some advantage because we added those four extra solar panels. So that's boosting our number up a little bit. Um, you can see from the day before that we were that our battery was depleted, so we were charging up from the grid overnight all the way through. And then on this day we had to do a long journey and our car wasn't full. So unfortunately we had to start charging the car for an hour here at peak time, paying uh, you know expensive units for electricity. But it's still cheaper than charging at a public charging point. You know, paying Octopus 40 something P for a unit of electricity is cheaper than paying Ionity or somebody 63 P. Uh, for the electricity there. So that's why we did that. Of course, I was still having some teething problems with Intelligent Octopus trying to figure out how to get it to do what I wanted it to do. And therefore, what I found is it wasn't charging overnight when it could have been. And then by the time I realized the off-peak tar tariff had ended and we're into the peak time tariff. So that's why I ended up having to pay for it. Uh, but you'll see in next month's update, during the course of June, it's been behaving a lot better and I'm getting the hang of it. Uh, so it's working out quite well. In terms of the worst day, this was the 6th of May. So at the beginning of the month, it was quite rainy and gloomy. So you can see from the day before, we didn't have enough charge in the battery. So we were charging the hot water, charging the car overnight and putting in a lot of kilowatts, you know, 36 kilowatts. And then from, from 5.30 in the morning, we we're on a trickle. But then during the course of the day, the solar production is pretty low uh, on this day. Although we still got, you know, nearly 11 kilowatts. But relatively speaking, it's quite low. And of course, we were therefore weren't able to put enough charge into the battery. And so we got to about 11.30 or whatever it is here. And then we're pulling more power from the grid to charge up again. In terms of household electricity consumption, so we're looking at the section to the far right over here. So we've obviously consumed a little bit less than we did the prior month. So last month it was 1,341 kilowatt hours. This month it's 1,250 exactly. In terms of the breakdown here, the coloured bars, so the grey sliver at the very bottom, this is our export back to the grid. So our goal is to minimise this as much as possible, unless we really have no other choice. The blue section here is the amount of power that our house is consuming for regular stuff like computers, charging phones, uh, boiling the kettle, whatever, right? And the blue section is what we ended up pulling from the grid to drive the house, because the, we didn't have enough charge in the battery and the solar power the solar panels were not producing enough. With In the month, though, we did produce 518 kilowatts worth of solar, which went towards driving our house. So this is the same thing as Wi-Fi, the kettle, the fridge, etc., etc. The various shades of red relate to the car. So you can see that we had a small sliver here, which is about 8 kilowatts, where we had charged the car at peak time. We had 99 kilowatts here, where we had charged the car off-peak from the grid. And then we had 230 kilowatts here where we managed to charge the car from solar power. Looking at the eddy, we've got 93 kilowatts here that we pulled off peak from the grid. And we've got 218 kilowatts that we managed to put into the eddy from solar power. So overall, that is our breakdown. What you're looking for is the lightest shade of these colors is solar powered energy. So compared to prior month, we've increased what went in the eddy and we've massively increased what went into the car. So we're definitely moving in the right direction. Okay, moving on to talk about gas. So of course, you know, we had some sunshine in the month of May. The second half was particularly good. So the amount of gas that we have consumed has dramatically dropped. And we've also been able to increase the amount of electricity that's been diverted for hot water. So we're not drawing gas. So you can see over here, 
compared to April, we've roughly halved the gas consumption in the main portion of our house, and we've probably taken about a third off in the north-facing portion of our house. And then um, I can't see the numbers properly, but you can see that we've reduced the amount of eddy energy we're pulling from the grid. The dark, darker green section is smaller than the previous month, and the lighter green is bigger, i.e. we're, instead of pulling it from the grid, using the free solar power. Okay, so in terms of looking at the Octopus bill, here's my bill. This is what I paid for the month of May. £94 for gas in the side portion, £76 for gas in the main portion, and £44.33 for electricity. This is peak and off-peak combined. And for the export, for the few kilowatts I gave back to them, they paid me £2.21. Okay, so if you find this helpful, please do remember to like and subscribe. Uh, those of you who are considering switching tariff, if you want to switch to any tariff on Octopus, you can use the referral link that you see on the screen here, and both you and I will receive a £50 thank you discount from Octopus. So if you want to subscribe online, just type this link into your browser or copy and paste it from the description below, and it will automatically apply, apply the £50 discount before you even check out. Or if you prefer to call them, if you call them in quote soft jewel 489, they will also be able to apply, apply the £50 voucher to the account in the same way. Okay, so as I said last month, you know, those of you who are reaching the end of your tariff or want to switch on to something smarter, I would strongly recommend that you have a look at the various tariffs that Octopus offers. Uh, first of all, all of their energy is completely green. Uh, second of all, uh, they're normally very competitive, if not the cheapest. Um, but again, it depends on which part of the country you are and how the standing charge gets built in. But they do have now three or four or five different smart tariffs. So depending if you just have an EV, if you just have solar panels, if you just have a battery, or you have a combination of this, or if you have a wind turbine, they've got a variety of tariffs. So one of them there, I'm sure, will meet your needs. So at the end of the day, if you do choose to switch and you use the referral here, then you're going to get £50 off your bill, regardless of which tariff you've chosen. Okay, moving on to look at my energy. So here is the graph of energy that we put into the eddy. So you can see um, the two different shades, the kind of green and the light grey shades that represents the two different immersion heaters. Uh, so you can see that the light grey immersion heater, which relates to the side water tank for our house, takes a lot more energy compared to the green one, which is the main portion of our house. And the problem there is that the immersion heater on the main portion of our house is top mounted. So heat rises, so the thermostat is saying the water's at temperature at the top of the tank. But at the bottom of the tank, it's still cold. Um, but So, so the, the eddy's doing what it can. The thermostat's saying it's at temperature, but then when we try and run the tap, we don't have enough hot water based on just the eddy. We have to have the gas on as well as a backup. Now the solution here is, you know, get a different tank with a bottom mounted immersion. Yep, that's expensive. Um, we could fit a de-stratification pump. So when the thermostat for the immersion tells the eddy that it's hit temperature, the eddy activates a pump which circulates water from the top of the tank to the bottom of the tank. So this is basically mixing all of the water in the tank together. So then if there's still capacity to heat it further, the thermostat on the immersion will tell the eddy, hey, I can take some more energy, send me some more. Um, so I got a quote for this and our local plumber who does the bulk of our work was coming in at like £650. And given that's roughly what I paid for the eddy in the first place and all this effort to divert um, solar power to the eddy instead of using gas is only saving us like 1 or 2p per kilowatt, for the time being I've decided to park the idea of the destratification pump. Um, it still makes sense but there's a balance to be found between, you know, is our tank getting old and we should just replace it anyway, in which case I'll make sure I get a bottom mounted immersion, or I think I can find a plumber who's just cheaper. Um, you know, he's not such a big company, he won't charge me VAT, the labor rate will be cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, that's the other consideration. Uh, some people are reporting that if they reduce the rate at which the EDE operates, instead of running at three kilowatts, we reduce it all the way down to like one kilowatt um, as the max power. And they're finding that their water stratif stratis stratifies less. So I'm going to experiment with that and see what happens. 
All right, moving on. So installer estimates, we're making massive progress over here. So first of all, by the end of year two, which is November or the end of this year, our installer thinks that we should have produced 9,832 kilowatt hours. Currently, we've produced 8,816. So we are 90% of the way there with about five or six months to run. So we're going we're to blow this out of the water. When you look at it on the chart, okay, we are trying to get the blue line to catch up with the, sorry, the blue curve to catch up with the blue line up here. So we're nearly there. In terms of consumption, our installers thinks, thinks that we only would only consume 50% of what we generate. So our year two target is to consume 4,916 kilowatt hours. We've currently consumed 8,239. So we are 168% of target. We're 68% past our target. In terms of, uh, so, so if you look back on the graph on the left, we wanted the green shaded area to catch up with this second green line by the end of this year. So you see, we in fact, we passed the second green line before the end of year one. So we're, we're a long way past. And finally, the green shaded area versus the blue shaded area, the difference is basically how much we're exporting. So we want to capture as much of this energy as possible and use it in our house. So having a higher percentage number on this graph and having a smaller gap between the two here, that is the goal. Now, of course, we can't capture everything that we're making because in the summer months like now, we are producing so much power that we can't put it in the hot water, we can't drive our house, we can't store it in the battery, we still have more surplus that we end up giving back to the grid. So um, it's inevitable. But the point is, as long as we keep the number up in this kind of order of magnitude, it's a good thing. Okay, so moving, why is this all important? It's because when you go to your installers and ask them for an estimate and they say that it's going to take 18 years to pay back the system, the reason I'm producing these graphs is to show you I'm on track to pay that back in less than half the time they told me. So what I'm telling you is your installer's estimates are not a little bit wrong, they are wildly wrong because they, they're told to underestimate the whole system. So they do that, but most of them don't factor in uh, the benefit of having a battery, which is making massive differences. If you have an electric car, it makes massive differences. So with all of these things in the equation, your payback period can get significantly reduced. The other thing is because we, we have high demand and we have a large roof space, we have a large array. So the bigger the system you install, I know it costs more money, but the quicker, relatively speaking, you recover the money. If you install a small system, and you use relatively little power in a day, you're going to find that it's hard to achieve the shorter payback periods that I'm describing because you have, you know, your levers have very little effect at the end of the day. So the things which have a big effect is get a battery, get an electric car. That's going to make this solar panel game really worthwhile. If you don't have those, it's still a good thing, but your payback is something like, 18 years uh, that could be a little bit improved now because of the energy prices that we're currently facing but that those are the kind of the reasons and that's how to if, if you're figuring out how do i tune these numbers and improve those are the different things to squeeze on okay so looking at the giant pivot table so let's focus on the last column the month of may so our system produced a thousand and twenty kilowatt hours of that we exported 54 that meant in total we consumed 966. Of the 966, we put 517 into driving our house, base day stuff like the fridge and the kettle and the phone chargers. Uh, we put 218 of that into the eddy to heat our hot water, and we put 230 into the car as free electricity to drive our car around for free. We imported 284 kilowatt hours from the grid uh, of electricity and we imported 1,499 of gas. CapEx has remained the same at 23,490. My unit rates for energy, um, the gas rate actually changed in April. I missed 
the tiny change. So I've edited uh, the previous numbers and all these numbers would have updated ever so slightly. But the remaining numbers have stayed the same for this month. Although on um, a different property, I got an update from Octopus yesterday that the prices are reducing by 17%. So I'm waiting to see if those changes also impact the tariff I'm on here with an intelligent octopus. So in terms of looking at these numbers now from a monetary point of view, having solar power has saved my house £215. Having the cheap overnight tariff has saved me a further £21. Having the eddy has saved me £22 by having free electricity to do hot water. And also being able to use the eddy overnight on the cheap rate has saved me a further £2.51. By exporting electricity, I have earned myself £2.21 from Octopus. And then looking at the car, charging the car from solar power has saved me £23.45. Buying peak time electricity has cost me £3.60. Buying off-peak electricity has cost me £7.45 and charging using the public network has cost me £3.65. Overall, by having an electric car and not using my diesel car for the same mileage, I have saved £289 compared to what it would have cost me to buy diesel. So the grand total of savings by having an EV adds up to £298.39. pence. So if you add up all the OPEX, for the month of May alone, we have saved £562.18 pence by having all of this equipment. So that is a massive saving, and in fact, it's the highest monthly saving we have ever accomplished. So there's probably three variables which are boosting this number up compared to any prior month. One, we've got four additional solar panels. Two, we've got two batteries versus one. Three, the energy prices are so high that the higher they are, the more solar power we have, the bigger the delta, the more money we're saving. Okay, so there's a fantastic saving there. So cumulatively, we have now saved ourselves £5,121.82 in the approximately 18 months that we've had the system. That leaves a balance of £18,369 until we break even meaning we've paid off 27%, 27.9% of our system so far. So, you know, by next month, we'll probably have paid off a third of the system already, which is really, really good. And therefore, on a linear basis, the spreadsheet here is forecasting that we will hit break even at seven years and one month and 18 days. Overall, for the month of May, our energy independence was 77%. So that's a really good number. And over the lifetime of the system, we're on 46%. So, as I say, the this number fluctuates quite a lot as we go through the seasons, but it'll, it'll settle over time. Uh, if I remember at the end of year one, the summary was that we were about two-thirds energy independent, which is what I predicted from the beginning. Okay, and finally, if we look at the payback curve, so... Um, the, aim of the game is to get this green line to catch up with this kind of bluey line near the top and overtake it. So the blue line at the top is the capex, the green line is the total opex. Um, so once we get this to catch up, we have broken even and then start to save or make money from our system. So the forecast is that will catch up around the seven year mark. Okay. So that is the entire um, month's summary. Feel free to like, subscribe, leave some comments, let me know how you got on. I imagine those of you who've got a south-facing system uh, will probably come back and report even greater returns than me. So please do add that in the comments. Always interesting to know where the sun's uh, shining more or being more effective. Um, as an interesting point for those of you who care, um, a relative who has solar panels as well, they have a string inverter system their panels are completely south facing and at this time of year they don't have any shading at all surprisingly my system is generating more so okay their array is a little bit smaller by comparison um but i think for some reason the fact that i've got micro inverters when we're getting to this level of sunshine for some reason my system is able to optimize and eke out a bit more in comparison 
Um, so I don't remember the numbers off by heart, but it's not noise. There's a there's a reasonable five or ten kilowatt difference, which um, surprises me because only half of the panels in my house are ever doing anything at one time because I face east and west, whereas in in this person's house they all face south, so they're basically working the entire day. Um, so it's interesting to know that even though half my panels are not really producing much every single day, overall when you add it all up, somehow I still manage to produce. A little bit more. It's probably those four south-facing panels that I've got are helping just to keep keep topping up the curve as we go along. All right. Well, I'll do my best to try and make next month next month's update more timely. But for the time being, uh, over and out. And given that I'm recording this three quarters of the way through June anyway, I've already got a few juicy facts lined up ready to share with you in the next update.